We came in so sober on Wednesday. <laughs> so much for taking a shot every time Obama said clean coal. You let Never. us down. Never. <laughs> did. Zero times. It's time to go digging for value. I'm Allison Southwick, and I'm joined as always by Taylor Muckerman and Joel South. We have a lot of earnings to cover, but first we're going to get to the headlines. Yes, so are. the first one is let's keep talking about the State of the Union address. Yeah. As we learned in Obama's State of a Union State of Union address, the all of the above strategy mm -hmm. for energy is working, at least according to Obama. However, if you ask the environmental groups like the Sierra Club, they will tell you that no, it's not working. And by all of the above strategy, it's that he's backing both fossil fuels and green energy. So let's take a step back. What did you think of the State of the Union address and this all of the above plan? Well, I think his all of the above plan is really just natural gas and renewables. If he was really into all of the above plan, he would have talked about nuclear, which was never mentioned, coal, which was never mentioned, fossil fuels were, um, and that kind of used that as a keyword. But, you know, he has two agendas right now. He's talking about natural gas, building that out. Uh, as the bridge fuel, fuel and also accreting jobs, but he also has a lot of carbon emissions by 2020. So the all of the above plan is not going to do both. You got to pick what way you're going. Are you going to cut carbon emissions totally or are you going to use the bridge fuel and maybe grow uh, renewables through that over the long term? All right, so put your wonk hat on. What policies do you like or would you support? So I, I think the all of the approach is the correct way to go, but you need to actually let the market work and create winners. You know, if you look at what Valero did, they threw a lot of money uh, into the ethanol production. Uh, the EPA had a lot of target goals that were supposed to go through through uh, 2020. Um, this year, you got a kind of, or the United States came up against a blend wall, and the EPA had to cut it back. So it kind of hurt Valero. So you know, if you go out and have a lot of policies. Uh, it really will restrict a lot of markets, very similar to what Solyndra did. They picked that company to be a winner through $500 million at it. company went bankrupt. There's a lot of companies out there that have great technologies, and I think all of the above approach will work. You know, companies like Exelon that have such a large uh, nuclear fleet, um, that, that's a great way to kind of build out a lot of other renewable fuels. You know, it's going to be more expensive. You're seeing the cost of solar come down. You're going to need all of the fuels uh, in conjunction to uh, eventually build out the uh, more carbon or less carbon um, intensive fuels. Yeah, it really caught me off guard that he didn't mention nuclear because the new head of the Energy Department, Ernest Moniz, his whole background stems largely from nuclear. And we saw him talk at the EIA conference, and he really talked about all of the above um, energy infrastructure in the United States. Nuclear was very much included in that. And Tom Fanning, Southern Corp's uh, CEO, was there talking about the same thing. And that company is yeah. really taking that energy uh, portfolio to the extremes with clean coal. So both of those guys are really influential, and the president didn't mention anything about it. Yep. So maybe that is more of a PR decision that he just didn't talk about it as opposed to an actual uh, Absolutely. Yeah, it could I mean, be, yeah. we talked Policy many times about shift. Keystone XL. That was never brought up either. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 right. That's a big question mark. <laughs> All right, well, let's head to Texas. We're going to head over to Fuel Fix, where they're talking about how 2013 was a good year for Texas production. But an economist is here to ruin the party. Mm -hmm. He argues that while oil production was up 20% last year, rig counts and jobs declined in the last three months of 2013. So so does that mean the party's over in Texas? It could mean that. You've seen production boom in the Eagle Ford and the Permian. Uh, almost a third of all U.S. oil production came from Texas in 2013 versus only 20% in 2008. So you can see the tremendous growth. And that's not because other regions weren't growing. The Bakken kept pace, even might have outgrown Eagle, the Eagle Ford and the Permian. But it just wasn't such a large base as Texas was to begin with. So Texas really caught up in 2013. But the fact that permit applications started to slow down down, that's a leading indicator of how much drilling is going to take place in the future. And so you have to be a little worried, but I do think production is there for the long term. Um, the boom was pretty much unsustainable, so maybe 2013, 2014 is kind of that inflection point. So who should be the most worried if this really is a sign of things to come? Uh, probably the smaller producers in the area, they might start to get snapped up. So it's not so much of a worry for the shareholders, maybe just for the companies. You, you have a little bit of a worry about your production slowdowns and having to explain that until maybe you do get bought up. Um, you look at companies like EOG and the Eagle Ford. Uh, they say they have about 12 more years of drilling inventory there. Uh, so they've already started a small dividend. So maybe you'd start to see them pull back on new wells and just use the production that they've got already drilled and start to use some of the capital expenditure 
ventures to return to shareholders on a, on a little bit bigger basis. But you talk about the Permian. Um, Apache Corp sold out about a third of its Egyptian assets to return to the Permian. So there is still a lot of belief here that there's production to be had. Uh, so I don't think investors need to automatically fret and sell out of their, in, their holdings here of companies operating in Texas. But you might just not expect the 30 to 40 to 50 percent year over year growth. Right. Adjust your expectations. Exactly. A bit. It's not a bad investment. It's just not a growth investment like it used to be. All right. Well, we're going to stay in Texas and we're going to keep talking about their production because over at Bloomberg, they're talking about how Texas is actually going to start sending oil to California. Mm -hmm. And previously, it was Saudi Arabia who was having all mm -hmm. the fun in California. Uh, Kinder Morgan is looking to ship crude on a 4,500 mile journey through the Panama Canal which is funny because border to border, California and Texas is only about 500 miles apart. <laughs> um, so what's, go what's going on here? Why, yeah, is it in the so, way. <laughs> why is it so difficult to get oil from Texas to California? You would think that uh, it would be a lot easier, uh, either through rail or pipelines, but there really is no infrastructure right there. So they're trying to go in the near term, and Kenner Morgan is a company that's getting a lot of the tankers and basically taking the oil from the Gulf Coast through the Panama Canal and all the way over. Obviously, that's very expensive, especially if you are moving United States crude, you have to have a tanker that's from the United States, it has to be United States made with the United States crew, and basically the tankers that fit that bill are in short supply. There's about a seven year wait list right now, and it takes about 10, it's about 10 times more expensive to use uh, Jones Act is what it is uh, called, to use a, a tanker from that qualifies for the Jones Act to move it. So yes, it's very expensive. However, if you actually compare it uh, to, say, moving uh, crude by rail, it's actually more affordable. It's about $10 a barrel, which will be the total expense. And if you're getting that uh, oil that's around $90, $93 from the uh, Eagle Ford and moving it over, uh, it's still comparable or better than what you're getting from the Saudi Arabia. And in comparison, if you look at Washington State and getting crude from uh, the Bakken, it's about 9 to $10. Uh, just move it that far. So if you were to move from Canada on down, it could be $13 or $14. So it's still affordable. But... You know, it's it's it could be a lot cheaper if uh, the Jones Act wasn't there. Right. So this Jones Jones guy, this Jones act guy. has been around. He's long dead and gone because <laughs> this has been on the book for long a time. very long time. So this law is. is <clears throat> Do we really need this law anymore? You know, I, I, I think there's probably still some good cases for it, but in in, a, in an area like this, you're moving crude uh, from Texas to California. The pipelines obviously aren't there, so it should be rescinded. Um, and the reason that is is. If you look at where California is getting their oil, 24% of the oil they're, get, they're importing is from Saudi Arabia. 13 more percent is from Iraq. So if the United States wants to be energy independent, they really got to start cutting back from the OPEC oil. And I think this is a perfect example using the production that we're getting 500 miles away and moving it or rescinding the Jones Act to get it over there cheaper. All right. Well, our last story of the day, we're going to head over to the Financial Times, where mining has had kind of a rough go mm -hmm. lately, but it's looking like it's going to be less rough maybe in the future, according to future, maybe? Possibly. Okay. Maybe for the copper sector, at least, because copper. there are some industrial uses for copper. Unfortunately, it's been so tied to China um, and the growth that people have been expecting there. And because they pulled back a little bit on GDP growth expectations, um, copper has been hit pretty hard. The prices were down in 2013 uh, due to oversupply. People still worry about a little bit of oversupply moving forward. Unfortunately, um, you can predict the supply because mines have to report that, but you can't always predict demand accurately. So warehouse inventories could be fluctuating. Um, actual demand from countries and importing it might not have accurate numbers. So. Um, Right now, everyone's talking about oversupply, but there are companies out there that believe whether or not they're just talking up their own game is yet to be determined. But um, because it is an industrial element, as growth continues in the United States to recover, and once Europe does really start to, to, to pick up some steam, I do think copper will rebound. So this can be kind of an area that is difficult for investors to make informed can, yeah. decisions in. So what's your advice for investors? Well, definitely look at a balance sheet because what you're really looking at here is mines that cost all different uh, amounts of sust all in sustaining costs is what they call it to produce. Some mines are much more economically feasible than others, but it's hard to determine that. So you really have to look at the financial strength of companies. And basically I'm looking at a company like Freeport, McMoran, Copper and Gold, uh, who's diversified themselves into oil and gas to kind of remove some of the volatility in copper and gold prices. Um, that being said, they're one of the larger copper producers in the in the world. And um, they, they really have a strong balance sheet, pay a good dividend. And they finished their 2013 relatively flat in the stock market. So I think you can pick this company up at a good price before it really starts to ramp up 
oil and gas production. And then you look at a company like BHP Billiton, who's producing more copper, so they're not as fearful as some others. Their copper production was up 6% in the back half of 2013. And with a company like this, they're more well diversified because they really produce a lot of iron ore as their, as their bread and butter on a volume basis. So um, look for companies that are diversified with a strong balance sheet so they can weather downturns like this. All right, that's going to do it for the headlines. It's now time to get into some earnings. <laughs> Yippee! <laughs> take a big, take a big deep breath because we've got a lot of co companies to cover here. The first one we're in of the which, thick of it. yeah, we are in the thick of it. The first one, um, one that we're going to talk about is Core Laboratories, okay. mm -hmm. and they reported this week. Joel, what did we learn? Uh, so this company, as always, turns in a good quarter. Yep. This is this quarter is the fifth straight quarter where they turn in a record. Uh, quarter and basically with this company, uh, th their business is really reservoir optimization, getting more out of oil wells primarily, and they do this better than anybody. Everybody uses them from big oil all the way down to mom and pop shops mm -hmm. uh, in somebody's backyard. This company really is fantastic, and there's a few metrics that they always go off of, and one's free cash flow. They uh, turn 29% of their revenue into free cash flow, which is fantastic, and that keeps going up. This was a fa fantastic number when it was down at 23, 24% earlier uh, last year, and it keeps increasing. They just keep getting more profitable. Return on invested capital is another metric they look at, by far and away the best in the oil and gas services industry. And then they like to return a lot of money to shareholders, and if you look at uh, the amount that they gave to shareholders this last quarter, $1.86 was returned to shareholders. If you look at their EPS, it was $1.43. So they're returning more to shareholders than they're actually bringing in, which means they have a lot of cash on hand. And on top of that, they doubled their dividend. So this is just a company, fantastically ran company. It, they have a service that basically commands whatever price the people, their customers want. So they're in a great niche. They understand what they're doing, and they do it better than anybody in the world. Man, it sounds like you like some. What do I you do think? like them. I, yeah. mean, is, I, mean, you're... I mean, we went down to visit them in, what was it, October? We went September, down there, September, uh, yeah, late September, and we got a tour of the facility. We were there for a few hours, and um, a lot of Kool-Aid around that those parts, and I drank it. I know Joel did, um, and mm -hmm. definitely believers, and I think one of the reasons why they haven't grown as much lately is because of the worries offshore, but their leverage offshore is much more than it is onshore, so as that industry starts to pick up, their revenue revenue line could really shoot up much further than you've seen in the past. It was our top stock of 2013 at the Fool um, that people might have seen at the bottom of our articles, and it was up over 70% last year. And uh, you very well could see maybe not 70% this year because the market started off a little bit rockier, but mm. they've got a great future. Yeah, their profitability is not going anywhere. Yeah, it's exactly. a long-term game. Yeah. All right, next company we got to talk about is Dow Chemical. Yeah, they reported and uh, they, they blew estimates out of the water, beat them by 50%. Um, all four of their main revenue segments uh, earned made a profit in the last quarter and a very strong full year despite activist investor Dan Loeb trying to kind of separate the parts and piecemeal it out to investors trying to build value. But Warren Buffett has come to their defense lately and said he likes this company right where it's at. Berkshire Hathaway is a shareholder. Um, so having Buffett at your back can never be a bad thing. And uh, you've seen them sell off a lot of assets lately. It's something that their competitor DuPont started in October of last year selling their performance chemicals business. Dow followed suit uh, just recently. So the whole industry, I think, is moving, uh, trying to shed some weight. But what they've seen is them really build up divisions to be sustainable on their own. So it's not like they're just casting off a sour portion of, of their portfolio. Um, they're really leaving investors on a positive note. Yeah, definitely. I, I just to cover a little bit more on that. Yeah. You know, this is a company that's really built or more building themselves on the cheap natural gas that you're seeing in the United States. And as you see that oil price above $90, you're going to see more and more people tap that market, creating a lot of NGLs, bringing down the price. Mm -hmm. You know, they have, they're trying to grow their EBITDA by about $10 billion through 2017, and that's really focused on Gulf area um, facilities that they're having that run off the cheap natural gas. So this is a company that's really taking advantage of a long-term trend, and they've been doing great things with it. Yeah, I'm amazed with how easily you say EBITDA. <laughs> All right, we're going to next, next company, practice. Enterprise Product Partners. Um, maybe not a household name. Uh, well, if you're in the MLP business, you are, because it's one of, <laughs> one of the better uh, pipeline companies in the United States. And this is a company that had earnings. They beat on revenue. Um, their earnings per unit also beat analyst estimates. But when you look at this company, um, unlike some of or a lot of MLPs, they don't have a general partner, so they don't have to pay what's called an incentive distribution, right? Which basically goes to a manage. It's basically a management fee. So a lot of their um, the money that they make is returned to actual unit holders. Um, a couple things that you want to consider with this company is they have extremely good credit rating, one of the best in the field, and what that does is allow them to invest. 
their business for the future. And right now they have $7.3 billion in uh, assets that they're building out right now. About $5 billion of those are going to be completed through 2014. So that's going to help that uh, distribution go to unit holders. And speaking of this company, 37 quarters in a row, they've increased their distribution. So that's over nine years, 2005. So they went through the whole entire financial cri crisis while consistently increasing their distribution to unit holders. And for MLPs, that's the m number one thing is in keeping that distribution coming back to unit holders. And to tie that discussion back to Dow Chemical, they just brought their ATEX pipeline on line to bring natural gas liquids down to the Gulf. Um, and I think that was earlier this month. So we're ready to see that ramp up and continue to drive the growth projects like Joel mentioned that they can attack because they have that low interest rate environment that they can really dive into. All right. And the last one we're going to take a look at is Potash Corp. Yeah, we're going north to Canada, uh, largest fertilizer company by volumes in the world that you can publicly own. Uh, they had a very rough fourth quarter, 46% drop in fourth quarter earnings on a year-over-year -year basis, but not because of their own personal operations. The industry was in all kinds of flux uh, throughout the whole back half of 2013, 27% decline in pricing for potash, and which is their lead, their lead ingredient for their revenue and, and earnings. So really suffered mightily. 5% um, growth they're expecting over 2013 for the whole market, um, but they really did drop down their overall expectations just in December when they announced that they're going to fire, I think, 18% of their workforce. So a little bit on us leaving 2013 on a sad note, but the market's kind of stabilizing after a rough of, after a rough year of price dropping to the floor, but we think we found that floor after recent deals with China. So um, while 2014 might be that transition year, Post-2014, mm -hmm. I like this company a lot. Yeah, and a lot of that drop came from the, the Belarus-Kelly uh, mm -hmm. split. And what that did is drop the prices of potash so much. So, you know, with a company that's very well run, uh, and you see 25% of its market cap get knocked off, yeah. you know, this is a commodity that's going to return. If you look at Euro Kelly, they shipped recently shipped 700,000 tons of potash to, to uh, China. And the price of that came in about 25% less than when the, uh, the, the uh, Belarus Cali was still mm -hmm. in place. So what you're seeing there is a, a commodity that's going to return. It, since it is cheap, there's going to be more usage. You know, this is a company that will return in a few years as the prices continue to go up. So, you know, this could be one of those opportunities where the company get, really gets hit. Uh, for something that really it wasn't in its own control and it could be a, a long-term buy. Yeah, later on in February, you'll see if it was hit um, out of the ordinary because you have uh, Mosaic, another fertilizer producer, reporting on February 11th, and Agrium, the late bloomer, on February 20th. A little bit more hedge because it has a retail business, but both of those companies are potash suppliers, so um, you'll be able to see if, if uh, one or the other was an outlier. All right, now it's time to take a look at some earnings ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a little thumbs down, thumbs up, or maybe even a meh do approach. You declare a thumb war. Right? So yeah. you guys are going to show me your bottom line, thumbs down, thumbs up, or eh, eh. Um, at the same time. And then we'll talk about the company. Sound okay. good? All yeah, right. So it's an eh, and then you switch. Oh, you're playing you that guy again. All right. All right, well, all right. Do what, yeah. Just do what you're going to do. All right. Go First up. company we're going to talk about is Suncor. Ready? Mm -hmm. One, two, three. All right. Oh, boom. All right, Joel, why don't you go first? <laughs> All right, well, this is the second big oil company that Warren Buffett owns. Uh, so if you look at Suncor, this is a company, uh, an integrated oil company that is significantly cheaper than all of the other big oil companies in the world. And the reason that is a lot of their production comes from the oil sands, and there's not a whole lot of takeaway capacity in the oil sands, so the, the oil, the crude that's coming from there is significantly cheaper. This is a company that's cutting back on some of that uh, production that's out of there and really focusing on, on higher returns. And what's really nice about this company is they use their integrated model, refine a lot of that crude, and 91% of all the crude that they produce worldwide is priced at the international price. So unlike a lot of their competitors in Canada in the oil sands, they're getting the international price for that. And like I mentioned, on a book, uh, book value, this company is significantly cheaper than, say, an Exxon, the other company that Warren Buffett owns. All right, you company. agreed? Yeah, I think this is a pretty close to asymmetrical bet. Um, a lot of the uncertainty, I think, is baked into the price, why they might be so cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, Keystone XL has been debated for five years, and they really haven't um, seen their stock price rise over that same time period because that might be the key to their ultimate success. So what I think they've been doing and what I like about it is they haven't been worried about drilling and drilling and drilling. They've worked on themselves internally, kind of 
remove their own bottlenecks from their internal supply chain. So I think once this whole uncertainty is unraveled, um, they could really open the floodgates from oil production. They even pulled back a little bit today on their natural gas production. So mm -hmm. they're ready once they get that takeaway capacity and they have tremendous potential. All right, next company, are you ready, is Spectra Energy. One, two, three, shoot. Oh, man, this is are you okay. going to agree on I'll, I'll go here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll go here. You're adjusting you it. You're taking a look at your notes and changing I'll go your here. Mind. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, what's you got over there? Tell, uh, you know, <laughs> give me a hint. Okay, fine. All right. Well, I like this company a lot right now because it's very diversified in the natural gas space. About 12% of all natural gas demanded in the U.S. flows through their, their system or their MLP system. They have Spectra Energy Partners and they have a joint venture with Philip 66 on their DCP midstream. But then they also have a regulated utility that might not be the sexiest business in the world, but it is a nice little bet on the power use in the United States. And what they've been doing lately is dropping down a lot of assets to Spectra Energy Partners. So they're getting cash for all these assets, and Spectra Energy is taking their debt while they're maintaining that general partnership, like Joel mentioned, with the, the distribution rights, they're getting about 80% of that from Spectra Energy Partners. So they're expecting huge uh, dividends to be paid their way, which then Spectra Energy investors are able to take advantage of. And through those di dividend distributions, um, they're looking at about $25 billion in potential growth projects. So um, this is a high dividend payer with actually a lot of growth in its future, which is a rare combination. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great business, and the reason I kind of do the <laughs> eh now is um, I'm kind of a wild card, and I want <laughs> I want a, I want a distribution that's a little bit higher. Uh, this is an extremely, extremely safe business. I want a little bit of risk in here. Uh, so, you know, I would like to see them if they were more involved. They're basically split off from Duke Energy, uh, very much a utility company. I would like to see them uh, have some pipelines that maybe connect into some plays, some emerging plays, say the Bakken, some crude oil out of there. Like I said, it's it's a fantastic business, and there's if you invest in it, you're making a great move. Uh, I would rather stick with an enterprise product partner, which we talked yeah, to a no little bit there. earlier. But like I said, Spectra Energy and all their MLPs are really good business. Stay away from my brake lines, wild card. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> if you don't already have a nickname from Mark Reith, I think you just got one. All right, next one, Atwood Oceanics. One, two, three, shoot. Man, you guys are he's bullish thumb, today. Thumbs up on everything. Man, I'm uh, you, well, you went from yeah. a thumbs up to a because eh, yeah. you're a, a wild card. So I don't know if you can really yeah. pick on them. Yeah. All right, Pour some Atwood Oceanics. Why do you like them? Atwood Oceanics, I like. Uh, they're a smaller offshore driller, and you know this. Them just like Sea Drill have young ships. They command higher uh, day rates, and their utilization rates are through the roof. Uh, if you look at Noble Corp, which just had earnings, you saw that their um, drill ships and their semi-submersibles -submersible, did well. You know, their, their day rates were up. Um, utilization rates were slightly up from the previous quarter. However, the jack-ups on, the, on uh, Noble were down. They're having a little bit of an older fleet. Uh, that, that's not the case here. I think this company is really going out and building on a smart level. They're not going out like Sea Drill and throwing a ton of debt to keep growing. They're growing at a smart pace. You know, they have a, a ship or so coming out every two or three years when it's affordable to do so. So they're growing at a smart pace. Management is on top of everything going on there. That's another company that we recently had an opportunity to visit. And they do a really good job maintaining their ships so they're always getting that higher day rate. Yeah, I like the flexibility Joel's mentioning and the youth that they're kind of rejuvenating their fleet with. Um, but I also like where management came from. Their CEO is from Transocean, so he knows what it takes to run a big company. And I think that's where he's trying to take Atwood, and uh, investors pr probably trust in him. All right, last company we're going to talk about is Arch Coal. All right. One, two, three, shoot. Ah. End on a sour note. You guys are one on mind note. today. Yeah, we should sit on opposite side of the office from now on. Taylor, tell yeah. me about Arch Coal. Um, well, they're in a tough business, American coal miner, um, not so diverse as a Peabody that reported uh, earlier this week. Um, their sales were up, actually, but pricing killed them, so their overall um, bottom line didn't really reflect the 1.3 million tons that they sold, um, which was a 2% increase, so not a whole lot, but in a tough market, 2% growth in sales volumes can really help out, kind of reversing the course. They've been shedding costs, um, which I think they're probably done with, but Arch Coal just isn't in the same boat as Peabody. They don't have the international exposure. Mm -hmm. they, they do have some export capability, but not as much. So as coal continues to falter, um, I'm a little bit worried. There are some possible bright spots. You look 
at um, steel uh, companies maybe re starting to restock a little bit as automotive strength and resident non-residential construction strength has has started to pick up a lot lately, especially in the United States. Um, but I'm I'm still on the fence on coal. Um, I, I'm personally invested in console energy. We talked about on Tuesday, so they're they're into coal, but they have a natural gas hedge in there as well. So a pure Strong. play on coal. I'm a little bit worried about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, um, you hear of the death of coal quite a bit. I don't think that coal is going to die. No, I, mean, I think there's some strong coal companies out there that have a lot of upside. However, with Arch Coal, they're such a thermal coal business, really uh, geared towards the domestic market, which I think is going to be in for a very, very hard landing for a long mm -hmm. period of time. So, you know, I still think there's a lot of deals in coal. Coal is going to be around. However, this company is, they're lo I mean, they've are they been losing a lot of money for a while. They have uh, a couple years down the line, they have a lot of debt that they'll have to re pay back. So it's there's still a lot of uncertainty there. And if there's not a big spike in coal prices, this company could really be hurt. Yep. All right, guys, well, that's, well, that's going to do it for oh, yeah. today then. If you are looking for more analysis in the energy sector, you want to follow us on Twitter at TMF Energy, and you also want to check out our free report, OPEC's Worst Nightmare. You can get a copy by emailing OPEC, O-P-E-C, at fool.com. For Taylor Muckerman and Wildcard South, <laughs> I'm Allison Southwick. Go Seahawks.